Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I am Nathaniel Rogers from thefilmexperience.net. And I'm Katie Rich from cinemablend.com. This week, instead of reviewing a new release, we're going to talk about 2009 so far. I, I have a pretty blockbuster heavy list, both because uh, it's the first half of the year and there's a lot of blockbusters, and because I think May had some of the best big movies of any summer month that we've had in a really yeah, long time. Yeah, it's been a good year so far. Yeah, it was really spectacular. So uh, number five is a movie that came out just last week, actually, Drag Me to Hell, which is Sam Raimi's Return to Horror. You've got Alison Lohman and Justin Long, and she gets cursed by this gypsy woman, and um, the title attempts to come true for her through various demons and shadows. and. So it's probably the most fun I've had in a movie theater all year. And it didn't make a lot of money. It kind of like it made like sixteen million last weekend. Yeah, I thought the the buzz on it seemed to be that people were very excited about it. So maybe it'll have great legs. I hope so. I enjoyed it so much. So um, that was my number five. Okay, great. And uh, <laughs> we have notes. <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped mine. And I think you liked the movie too. A quick shout out to my runner up, which is Anvil. Oh yeah, yeah. The story of Anvil, which is a documentary about a, a hair band, a heavy metal band, um, who've been trying to make it for decades. Yeah, well, they well, they almost did make it. They were pretty close, like back in the yeah. '80s. And it was a little depressing, actually, but mm -hmm. it's also funny and endearing. And if you like documentaries, it's definitely yeah, it's like it's like Spinal Tap, but very honest and truthful. All right. Truth is stranger than fiction yeah. because it feels. Totally. A lot like exactly. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> My fifth choice is Duplicity. It also didn't make much money. Right. Frankly, surprised me the polarized reviews because I thought it was really fun. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a Julia Roberts devotee, but I thought she was really fun in it. I loved the repetitive structure. Yeah, it's so cleverly put together. Yeah, and I, I love the beginning. I, w I was laughing so much at the very beginning with the Paul Giamatti and Tom Wilkinson. Uh, the fight for the <laughs> ages on the airport tarmac. I'm, I'm dying to see that movie again just to see that yes. that part. We saw that together. And yeah, it was did. It was such a good time and the audience really loved it and then... Yeah. Uh, that's actually my number four. Oh, okay. So that leads very well into mine, and I, I, I don't really have any much else to add. You know, it makes you feel like you're watching one of those Hitchcock movies that was all about scenery, like Catch a Thief or something like that. It oh, had, right. that, that definitely vibe to it, without all the Hitchcock psychological undertones. <laughs> it's the fun uh, Hitchcock. A, a popcorn Hitchcock. Yeah, exactly. Instead of Psycho. Exactly. Number four is, uh, does not star Julia Roberts, but it is called Julia. Don't be mistaken, it's not um, cheery and bright like Julia Roberts. <laughs> It stars Tilda Swinton, who you may remember won the Oscar uh, very recently for Michael Clayton. With Tony Gilroy, it all, it's all tying together right it now. Is. <laughs> it's the duplicity. Yeah, um, yeah, and that was with Tony Gilroy. So that, that got her a lot of uh, more mainstream award attention. But she's been doing great work since the 80s. And she plays an alcoholic who ends up embroiled in sort of a very ill-conceived uh, kidnapping attempt. And it's all about her performance, so if you love acting, mm -hmm. it's the type of movie that you have to see. And, and despite the subject matter, it's very watchable. Like when, when I saw it, it's over two hours long, and it's about kidnapping and poverty and all this awful stuff, and I, I expected it to be a real slog, but I enjoyed mm -hmm. watching it a lot. For stars who have to carry a movie, I think what you really need for something like that is electricity, and I really think she has that. She's such a vital performer, like you don't know what she's going to do from yeah. scene to scene. Yeah. Uh, my number three, which is going to pull us right back into blockbuster territory, is Star Trek, which uh, I I only gave it four stars out of five when I reviewed it, and um, but then I saw it twice, and every time I think about it, I get so happy because it was just it's the most like joyful, fun, well crafted blockbuster I've seen in such a long time. Like really harkening back to the original Spider Man movies, where you just get this sense of playfulness with the pretty rigid structure of a blockbuster movie. Where and everything kind of has to happen in a very certain way, but J.J. Abrams and his cast just have such a good time with it. And the music is great, and the action is great, and despite the lens flares, it looks really good. And um, I just, I enjoyed seeing it so much. It's one of the few movies that I've walked out of thinking, I cannot wait for a sequel. It's, and it's the highest grossing movie of the year. It beat out Wolverine to 200 million, which makes me so happy. Because so much better it's so than Wolverine. much better. Yeah, I think the difference with, between uh, Wolverine and Star Trek is that... One is joyful and one is joyless. So yeah. Wolverine feels like homework, which yeah. it should not feel like. Totally. Um, and I and I like that you um, that you reference the original Spider-Man movies like they were a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, we've been through so much right. in this tech. We've been through so many superheroes and so yeah. many big budget geek sci-fi things, yeah. 
and so many of them can just feel like such a slog. And it's really just the rare people like J.J. Abrams, like Jon Favreau with Iron Man, or like Sam Raimi, who can really take something that's so big and unwieldy and make it feel light on its feet. Right. And I, I'm going to talk, talk about my number two and my number three together, because they're both animated films, and my number two is Coraline, and my number three is Up. And the reason I bring them up together is that lists making is very subjective, and you know, these are very subject to change. When the top 10 comes at the end of the year, things could be in totally different order. Like right now, I prefer Coraline, mm -hmm. but just barely. And But they're both so imaginative and, and that feeling that you had with Star Trek, I felt at both of them. Yeah. It's not something crass, like they're happy movies, but they just, they're, they're such a joy in the sort of creation of them. Mm -hmm. I just saw the off-Broadway musical version oh, of Coraline yeah, yeah. as well. And I've read the book, so it's like Coraline is dear, dear <laughs> to my dear heart. Very dear to uh, then up, but they're both, you know, so fantastic, mm -hmm. and they both did really well. Coraline was a slow burn, but it really, yeah. it wound up making a, a good amount of money, and yep. I mean, it came out in, what, February, and yeah. that was such a dark time for movie going. <laughs> I was seeing so many terrible movies, and yeah. Coraline was just this like, wonderful gift to be like, keep going, you can get through this year, <laughs> yeah. get to summer, and it'll, be, it'll get better. Um, my number two uh, is called Sugar, and it's by... Uh, and Brian Fleck and Anna Bowden, who made Half Nelson, which got Ryan Gosling an Oscar nomination a couple years ago. And they could have turned this into making a big studio movie. They could have, you know, cast Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams in Notebook 2. They could have done whatever they wanted. But they made this movie that's about Dominican baseball players who come to the United States with no money. They're just kind of like put into this farm system, like the old Hollywood studios, where you're owned by your team. And, you know, they pay for your lodging. They pay for your food. You live with families will take care of you and it's about this one kid sugar who comes from the dominican republic and just kind of about his journey through the baseball system and um i, I love baseball i love baseball movies so i really enjoy that element of it but it's just a very like great american story told in this really nice visual style these two filmmakers really excite me i'd love to see what they do so i really enjoy this one i'm feeling the cinephile shame that i have because <laughs> i also really enjoyed half nelson and my number one of the year so far is hunger um, Hunger actually came out in L.A. in 2008, but it only opened in L.A. for one week. Anyway, it opened in 2009. Um, still, no one went to see it. <laughs> Very dark and, and depressing. I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody to be like, you should go see it. Well, not, not just to any, anybody. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I, don't want to, this, I don't want this to sound condescending, but like for people who really care about the cinematic medium and what, and what you can do with it, there's so much meat to the presentation of the story, which is about Bobby Sands and the hunger strike in um, in these prisons in, in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. It is a tough sit. Yeah, definitely. But if, if you really care about the cinematic medium, Steve McQueen, who directed it, and you can tell he's an artist mm -hmm. originally. He's people. very interested in like what you can do, like all the visual tricks that you can have yeah. in a film. And not in like a gimmicky way. No. Very intense juxtapositions of what he's doing with the sound and what he's doing with the mm -hmm. image. And I, I was just really wowed by it, but, it is, but it's a difficult... Yeah. Book, so. Well, in the narrative, too, he kind of, like, he starts you off with one character and then you're following another character and then it takes you about half an hour to really get to the main character with the, to get to Bobby Sands. Yes. So he's really kind of testing you to see where, if you'll go with him on this trip. Mm -hmm. And then there's that 18-minute like, unbroken take of the conversation, yeah. which is really, like, stunning. Yeah. Or film geeks. Yeah. It's very exciting. <laughs> yeah. I, I love I, long takes. Long takes are the best. Okay. Yeah. My number one is Up. We talked about it last week a lot, yes. so I don't know if we really need to go into it more, but um, the more I think about it, the more I love it. It's just, it seems more intricately crafted and beautiful the, you know, the more I think back on certain scenes or certain lines. I mean, Wally was my number one movie of last year, so mm -hmm. Pixar continues to have a grip on me. So thanks for joining us. Um, try to get tickets to those things if they're still in theaters. Yeah, a lot of them are. If you, um should choose to watch them at home, especially Hunger, which is the only way you'll be able to watch it. I yeah. really ask that you turn off all your cell phones. Like you <laughs> would if you were in a movie in a theater. theater. Pretend you're in a theater because, uh, it, you know, with, with really, with challenging cinema or with great cinema, you really need your attention to be on it. So like yeah. the idea, like that's, that's the one drawback of, of how accessible cinema is now is that people watch cinema like it's TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some movies are not meant to be seen that I'm way. guilty of it too. Yeah. You know, no, you're, you're too. watching on DVD and there's a lot of things to distract you. Yeah, I am too. I, I, we lecture I our viewers. <laughs> but I definitely use the, the you know, pause button. and uh, But that that's the type of movie that really benefits from like refusing yeah. to look away. Yeah, exactly. 
All right. Well, thanks for joining us. And um, I'm Katie from CinemaBlend.com. And I'm Nathaniel from the filmexperience.net. We'll talk to you soon.